With the Thanksgiving season upon us, I thought it'd be a great opportunity to travel back in time to the days of colonial America. Then I realized there's not really a lot of movies about the actual Thanksgiving story. So I decided to go with something that, although it's not the Thanksgiving story itself, could still transport us back to those days. And it's also a great opportunity to do something we haven't tackled yet on the podcast, a Disney animation. In the mid-1990s, the animation team at Disney was on a roll. Tapping into their pool of talent, Aladdin animator Eric Goldberg and The Rescuers Down Under director Mike Gabriel teamed up to take on a new challenge, adapting a true story for the big screen in Pocahontas. Time to release on exactly 400 years after the real Pocahontas was born, Disney released their own musical interpretation of the story on June 16, 1995. The movie boasted an amazing all-star cast, including Irene Bedard, Mel Gibson, and Christian Bale, just to name a few. With a budget at about $55 million to make, it was a smash hit in the box office as it raked in over half that in the opening weekend alone. In all, it made over $140 million in theaters. At the time, that put it at number 8 on the all-time Disney list of box office results. Of course, as time goes on, it's dropped quite a bit. As of this recording, thanks to Disney's acquisition of Pixar and Star Wars, Pocahontas is at number 65. While it was certainly a box office success, Pocahontas was severely criticized by a lot of historians for telling a tale that most people now believe to be a true story, when in fact, it was almost entirely inaccurate with what actually happened. I'm Dan Lefebvre, and this is Based on a True Story. Before learning about Pocahontas, I want to let you know that this show is supported by listeners just like you. And if you want to help me keep the lights on so I can keep making this show, you can show your support for the show over at Patreon. (laughs) That's a lot of shows. If you're not familiar with Patreon, it's a third-party website that lets you directly support content creators like me. You can sign up to be a patron of the podcast over at patreon.com slash based on a true story podcast. There's no obligation. You can offer as much or as little as you want. And whatever you can offer goes a long way to helping to make sure that I can continue paying the numerous costs of the show and continue providing what you hopefully find as quality content. As an added little bonus, I like to give my patrons some extra goodies. So if you've ever wondered why a movie was picked, how the show comes together, or just what's coming next week, all while making sure that this show continues hop over to patreon.com slash based on a true story podcast. Once again, that's patreon.com slash based on a true story podcast, all one word. You can find a link to that in the show's notes too. And now on with the show. The movie begins in 1607 as a ship, the Susan Constant, sets sail from London to the New World carrying John Smith, who's voiced by Mel Gibson. The primary purpose for the voyage appears to be the desire to strike it rich, gold. Or so the opening song, called The Virginia Company, would have us believe. And this is mostly true. In April of 1606, England's King James I granted a charter to a private stock holding company simply named the Virginia Company. The purpose of this company was simple, establish a colony in Virginia, hence the name. While there certainly was the hope of getting rich through precious metals like gold and silver, that was not the primary reason. You see, in 1564, the French built a fort near what's now Jacksonville, Florida. Fort Caroline was intended to be a permanent colony, but that was short-lived. A year later, in 1565, the Spanish established St. Augustine nearby. You can actually still see the remnants of this early establishment in St. Augustine, Florida today. And it didn't take long for the Spanish to assert their dominance when they slaughtered the French at Fort Caroline. With tensions high in Europe, the English didn't want the Spanish to own this new land and any riches it might contain. So yes, gold was one of the reasons the Virginia Company was founded to fund a voyage to the New World, but it wasn't the only reason. 
In the movie, as they're traveling, John Smith is made out to be somewhat of a hero as he saves the life of a younger sailor named Thomas during a raging storm. Thomas is voiced by Christian Bale. Half of that is true. You see, Susan Constant was a real ship, and many historians believe her maiden voyage was the 1606 trip with two other ships owned by the Virginia Company. And John Smith was on board, but he wasn't considered a hero. And we don't know about this storm that uh, supposedly caused this relationship with John and Thomas. In fact, John was charged with mutiny on board the Susan Constant, and the captain of the expedition, a man by the name of Christopher Newport, wanted to have John executed as soon as they landed. So the journey that began at the Blackwall docks on the Thames River in London on December 16, 1606, neared its end in early 1607. They stopped briefly for water at the Canary Islands before the three ships hit the West Indies on March 23, 1607. A few weeks later, on April 10th, they left the Caribbean and sailed north, reaching what's now Cape Henry, Virginia on April 26th. But they didn't want to settle so close to the ocean. That's what the French did with Fort Caroline. So they spent two weeks trying to find a place to start their settlement. Finally, on May 14th, 1607, they found a plot of land in what would become known as Jamestown. As they did, Captain Newport opened the unsealed orders from the Virginia Company that he had been commanded to follow upon landing in the New World. To his dismay, the orders named John Smith as one of the leaders of the new colony. John's life was spared, and the settlement we know as Jamestown was founded. Back in the movie, we cut to a scene where we're introduced to Pocahontas. The voice for Pocahontas is Irene Bedard, and Judy Cunn does the singing voice. She's betrothed to a warrior that she's not too fond of, but as an arranged marriage, she doesn't have a lot of say in the matter. Instead, she gets advice from a talking tree spirit. In the movie, this is Grandmother Willow, played by Linda Hunt. While the fact that there's no proof of a talking tree spirit may not come as a surprise to you, perhaps what's more surprising is how inaccurate this whole premise is. Let's start with her name. It wasn't Pocahontas. Her real name was Matawaka. The name Pocahontas was her nickname, and it can be interpreted to mean spoiled child. The movie depicts an exploratory John Smith as he loves discovering this new world. As he does, Pocahontas discovers John, and after a Disney-esque game of cat and mouse where Pocahontas tried to hide in the bushes as she's intrigued by John, once John manages to see her, it's love at first sight. And then it doesn't take long for the two to hit it off. This is all fiction. Well, at least that's the prevailing theory. None of this is documented, so there's no way to know for sure. However, in 1607, Metoeka was only 10 years old. So even though women of her tribe were considered to be of age at only 13, it's highly unlikely there was any sort of a romantic relationship between her and the Englishman John Smith, who himself was about 27 at the time. And it's also not likely John would have been wandering about the forest as he did in the movie. Cute raccoons and birds aside, remember that he was about to be executed by the men on the ship had it not been for the explicit command of the Virginia Company. So while he wasn't destined to death, it would make sense for the men to keep a close eye on him. There wasn't a lot of trust there. In the movie, Chief Powhatan sends warriors to scout the new arrivals. And well, before we continue, let's set some context here. Chief Powhatan is played by Russell Means in the movie. That was the name that many historians used to refer to the leader of the Powhatan nation. Another name of his was Wahansaneka. Whatever people referred to him as at the time, the descendants of the Native Americans in our story are the Powhatan Renape Nation today. After fighting off and injuring one of the Powhatan scouting party, the Englishmen decide to go to war with the Powhatan nation in the movie. At the same time, in the movie, Chief Powhatan declares a war on the English in retaliation. Pocahontas has hit it off with John, and she decides she must stop the war by getting John and her father, Chief Powhatan, to talk and see reason. She sneaks off and ends up kissing John under the talking grandmother willow tree. 
tensions hit an all-time high as both the warrior Pocahontas was supposed to marry a man named Kokuum, who's played by James Apomet Fall, and Thomas, who's played by Christian Bale, see the two kissing. Kokuum yells and attacks John. In the ensuing fight, Kokuum is about to kill John before Thomas rushes in and shoots Kokuum. He dies, and a distraught Pocahontas flees. While we don't know a lot about him, Kokuum was a real person. According to the account of an unknown Englishman who was a part of the colony at the time, Kokuim was a, quote, private captain, end quote, of the Padawamic tribe. The Padawamic tribe was a part of Powhatan's alliance of peoples and would later end up offering help to the English when Powhatan wouldn't. So even though Kokuim was real, he didn't die in 1607 as the movie implies, we know this because Kokuim and Matawaka were actually married in 1610, according to historical accounts from Jamestown. Back in the movie, Pocahontas comes to the rescue just as Powhatan is about to kill John Smith. She flings herself across his body, declaring her love for him. With a change of heart, Powhatan decides not to attack the Englishman, but the stereotypical evil Governor Ratcliffe, who's played by David Odkin Steers, grabs a gun and shoots at Powhatan. John jumps in the way, saving Chief Pohacken's life by taking the bullet for himself. Wounded, John must return to England if he has any hope of survival. And that's how the movie ends with a sad splitting of Pocahontas and John as the two lovers must separate. As you might imagine, this is all made up for the movie. Although the reason for John Smith's return is surprisingly close to what actually happened. In October of 1609, John Smith was injured by an accidental explosion of gunpowder while in his canoe. He was forced to sail back to England for treatment. After two and a half years of trying to establish the colony at Jamestown, John Smith left Virginia, never to return. But while the movie may end here, that's not the end of the story for Matawaka. For years, the Jamestown settlement had struggled to survive. Two-thirds of the colonists died before 1608 when a shipment of supplies arrived from the Virginia Company in London. But this wasn't enough. Between 1609 and 1610, 80% of the people died of starvation in the frigid winters. One of the primary reasons for this was because many of the colonists who had come were well-to-do Englishmen who knew nothing of agriculture. Chief Powhatan had a policy in his people that simply meant those who didn't work wouldn't eat. So he wasn't keen on helping the Englishmen who themselves weren't keen on working the ground. After John Smith returned to England, the head of the colony was a man by the name of George Percy. George was not a very good negotiator, and the English relationship with the Powhatans didn't get any better. Of course, it didn't help that as the colonists continued to survive, they also continued to expand their land, taking away lands from the local tribes. During this time, Matawaka reached adulthood. That is, she was about 14 years old and began to take on the responsibilities of an adult woman in the tribe. She would have looked quite different than the image that we see in the Disney movie. In real life, Matawaka would have worn a deerskin apron in the warm weather and a special leather mantle that indicated her status as the daughter of the chief. She would have had leggings and a breech clout that would help protect herself from scratches as she hiked in the woods. But probably the biggest difference in her appearance would have been the tattoos. Matawaka decorated her skin by covering it in tattoos. After marrying Kokuim in 1610, we don't really know what happened to Matawaka for the next few years. She disappeared from any record, so it's likely that she was simply living her life with her new husband. Her life would drastically change in 1612 when, at the age of 17, she was taken prisoner by the English. Historical records indicate it was the plan of Captain Samuel Argall. Captain Argall was trying to find ways to defeat Chief Powhatan's alliance and soon saw a chance to swing the balance in his favor. Of the local tribes, the Padawamic people were, who were part of Chief Powhatan's alliance had on more than one occasion shown themselves to be less than loyal to the alliance in favor of the Englishmen. Captain Argall found out that Matawaka was living with the Padawamic people, and then he tried to convince them to help him kidnap her. But they didn't agree at first. 
Eventually, though, Captain Argal was able to convince Eopasis, the brother of the Padawamic chief, to help. Eopasis used his wife, who told Matuaka that she wanted to go on board the English ship. But according to her, she would only go if Matuaka would accompany her. Finally, she gave in. Eopasis, his wife, and Matuaka ate a meal with their English hosts on board the ship. When they were done, the three tried to leave, and Captain Argall wouldn't let Matuaka leave. He claimed that she would be held until her father returned some English prisoners and stolen weapons. For their part in turning Matuaka over, Eopasis and his wife left the English boat with a few small trinkets, the largest of these being a tiny copper kettle. Captain Argall had Matuaka taken to a nearby settlement where she was put under the care of a man by the name of Reverend Alexander Whitaker. Reverend Whitaker taught her the English language about Christianity and English customs. Although she was technically a prisoner, she seemed to have been treated fairly well, you know, besides the whole not being able to return home thing. Chief Powhatan heard of the kidnapping and tried to do everything he could to get his daughter back. He essentially submitted to the English demands, doing whatever they asked, without question. But Matawaka was never returned. It was while she was staying with Reverend Whitaker that Matawaka first met a man by the name of John Rolfe. If you've heard this name, perhaps it's because John was the man who introduced tobacco to the settlers in Virginia. According to English accounts, John and Matawaka fell in love almost right away. But then again, we don't have Matawaka's perspective, and she was, after all, still a prisoner. What we do know is that in 1614, Matawaka converted to Christianity. Her name changed to Rebecca, to reflect being born again. Then, on April 5th, 1614, John and Rebecca married. After this marriage, the Powhatan Alliance and the English enjoyed a period of peace. The tensions lifted a bit more a couple years later when Mat uh, Rebecca rather, <laughs> had a son. John and Rebecca named him Thomas. Hearing the news of Chief Powhatan's daughter being married to an Englishman and converting to Christianity, the Virginia Company back in London decided to try to capitalize it. They wanted to use Rebecca as a means to an end to raise more money for the colonies. During the summer of 1616, the Rolfe family got an all-expenses-paid trip from Virginia to London. When news of Rebecca coming to England began to swirl, John Smith caught wind of it. He was in England at the time, and he wrote a letter in 1616 to Queen Anne. The full text of it is too much to include here, but here is an excerpt. Quote, so it is that some ten years ago, being in Virginia, and taken prisoner by the power of Powhatan, their chief king, I received from this great savage exceeding great courtesy, especially from his son, Nantequas, the most manliest, comeliest, beholdest spirit I ever saw in a savage, and his sister, Pocahontas, the king's most dear and well-beloved daughter being but a child of twelve or thirteen years of age, whose compassionate, pitiful heart of my desperate estate gave me much cause to respect her. I, being the first Christian this proud king and his grim attendants ever saw, and thus enthralled in their barbarous power, I cannot say I felt the least occasion of want that was in the power of those my mortal foes to prevent, notwithstanding all their threats. After some six weeks fatting amongst those savage courtiers, at the minute of my execution, she hazarded the beating out of her own brains to save mine. And not only that, but so prevailed with her father that I was safely conducted to Jamestown, where I found about eight and thirty miserable, poor, and sick creatures, to keep possession of all those large territories of Virginia. Such was the weakness of this poor commonwealth, as had the savages not fed us, we directly had starved. And this relief, most gracious queen, was commonly brought to us by this lady Pocahontas." End quote. Now, if you want to read the full letter from John Smith to Queen Anne, I'll make sure to put a link to it in the show notes. 
So in this letter, John tells the queen how he was about to be executed, but Matawaka convinced her father to spare him. But not all historians believe this actually happened. John Smith was prone to eh, stretching the truth a bit. He was well-spoken, and he told a great story to gain popularity. And it worked. By the time he wrote the letter to Queen Anne, John was one of the most popular English explorers of his time, so his words carried weight. But we have to question if it even happened, as John claims. When the Rolfe family made it to London, Rebecca and her family, along with a dozen or so Powhatan men and women who came with them, were paraded around the country alongside King James I and Queen Anne as the, quote, savage, end quote, who was saved. This marketing trip ended up lasting about a year. Just before heading back, John Rolfe and Rebecca were tracked down by John Smith. He met them at a party, and when Rebecca saw him, she turned her head and disappeared for over two hours. John later recounted what happened when he was finally able to talk to her. According to John, when she saw him, she was reminded of the, quote, courtesies she had done, end quote. Then she said something that made John squirm. Rebecca said to John, quote, You did promise Powhatan what was yours would be his, and he the like you, end quote. After this, she called him a, quote, father, end quote, and mentioned something John had done back in Virginia. John had called Chief Powhatan father when he was a stranger in a new land. According to Rebecca, quote, and by the same reason, so I must do you, end quote. Sensing his discomfort, Rebecca told John matter-of-factly, quote, Were you not afraid to come into my father's country and caused fear in him and all his people but me? And fear you here, I should call you father? I tell you, then I will, and you shall call me child, and so I will be forever and ever your countryman, end quote. The conversation ended when Rebecca told John that many of the Native Americans of Virginia didn't believe he was still alive. But her father knew better. He was convinced John Smith was still alive and that they should try to go find him. Quote, because your countrymen will lie much, end quote. It was the end to what must have been an awkward conversation, the kind of tension that you can cut with a knife. A few weeks after this encounter, in March of 1617, Rebecca had come down with a sickness when the Rolfe family boarded a ship bound for their home in Jamestown. Sadly, things took a tragic turn before they even left London. As the boat was traveling down the Thames, Rebecca's sickness got really bad. Historians don't know the specifics of what sickness it was. Some claim dysentery, while others say it was probably pneumonia. What we do know is the boat was hardly started on its journey when it made an emergency stop at Gravesend, a town in northwest Kent, England. There, Rebecca died in her husband's arms. On March 21, 1617, the 21-year-old Rebecca Rolfe was laid to rest at St. George's Church in Gravesend. Over 17 years later, John Smith wrote what made its way into the story we know of Pocahontas today. It was in a book called General History of Virginia that he wrote in 1624, recounting many of the events that took place while he was in the New World. Here is an excerpt from the book, and you'll note that John actually is speaking in the third person, so when he says him, he's referring to himself, John Smith. Quote, Two great stones were brought before Powhatan. Then, as many as could lay hands on him, dragged him to them, and thereon laid his head. And being ready with their clubs to beat out his brains, Pocahontas, the king's dearest daughter, when no entreaty could prevail, got his head in her arms and laid her own upon his to save him from death." End quote. Today, Many historians debate the accuracy of this account as well. Many claim John's account was exaggerated. Why else would this be the first time we'll hear about the 17 years after Matawaka's death? 
other historians, such as Professor J. A. Leo LeMay from the University of Delaware, suggest that this actually did happen. According to many historians who subscribe to Professor LeMay's theory, the reason for John Smith's tale showing up 17 years after her death was merely because there was a growing popularity around Metoaka's life at the time. John was doing what he did best, capitalizing on a good story to gain popularity. And the story only grew over the centuries. The first story to include a love interest between Metoaka and John Smith was John Davis's 1803 book called Travels in the United States of America. But it certainly wasn't the last, as we learned with Disney's Pocahontas. While most of Disney's tale may not be true, one thing we know was true. Matawaka may have not had the life she imagined when she was wrongfully imprisoned and ultimately sent to a country she'd never known. But she was an amazingly powerful woman. Her story is inspiring to us all. And her children have carried on her legacy. Among her long line of descendants are such inspirational women as President Woodrow Wilson's wife, the First Lady of the United States, Edith Wilson, and another First Lady, Nancy Reagan. This episode of Based on a True Story was written and produced by me, Dan Lefebvre. If you want to learn more about the life of Matoaka, there is a treasure trove of great resources out there. I'd recommend starting with articles at the Powhatan.org and AncientOrigins.net websites. I'll make sure to put a link to those in the show notes. Thanks for listening to the Based on a True Story podcast. If you've made it this far into the episode, you're probably just like me and absolutely love both movies and history. But we're not the only ones, so if you know someone who might be interested in hearing the true story behind movies, it'd mean the world to me if you would share the Based on a True Story podcast with them. Or if you prefer, you can leave a rating and review on iTunes to let the world know just how amazing the show is. Or you could do both. <laughs> oh, and remember, you can sign up for the Based on a True Story newsletter over at the show's home on the web. There you'll find all of the show notes, many, many more episodes, and much more based on a true story podcast.com. You can get in touch with me directly on Twitter at Dan Lefebvre, D-A-N-L-E-F-E-B, or on the Based on a True Story Facebook page at facebook.com slash based on a true story podcast. Finally, with Thanksgiving just around the corner, this is a great time of year to spend time with family and friends. So even if you're not in the United States, from my family to yours, happy Thanksgiving. I wish you and yours a most glorious holiday. <laughs>